the way I like to think of NFTs really is there are perpetual interoperable tickets or rights, right? Hmm. Perpetual in the sense that they always live on the blockchain. Uh, hmm. They're interoperable because you can have an asset that lives on one platform, but you can just index and improve your ownership of it on another platform and say, hey, yeah, I own this asset. And you can leverage that, right? And, and they're rights and tickets because you can assign you know, benefits to them. You can assign uh, access. And um, you're seeing that with, you know, uh, for example, Gary V did his fly fish restaurant and if yeah. you own that asset, uh, the NFT, you get access to that club. Ladies and gentlemen, we're so excited for you to tune in because this is a very special episode. And for the longest time, I finally have Joe from Avalas be on this podcast. Joe, thank you so much for taking the time. Yeah, this has been a long time in the making, I guess, since uh, the Avalanche Summit back in Barcelona. Great to be here. Thanks for having me. Yes, absolutely. Super excited for you to be here as well. Would you mind take a quick second before I ask you the very exciting question and share for you to share the story? How did you get into the crypto space? Could you tell us a little bit about what's your role like at Avalabs? Just rolling back, I, I got into crypto about, I think it was like end of 2015, early 2016. And at that time, obviously not many people knew what was going on, neither, neither did I. Uh, and I was just researching, reading, but really got into just mining Bitcoin. And... That was uh, that was an interesting time. Uh, you know, there was a lot of unknowns about this space, but I was just mining Bitcoin and then started researching more about the you know ICO era back in 2017. That was insane, and uh, really the only first utility of crypto at the time was just investing in projects. That, that was pretty much it. From there, just did a bunch of internships. Worked at Shares Post for a little bit, doing security tokens. Uh, worked at some other early stage companies uh, during the ICO era that don't exist today. <laughs> but I founded uh, Cornell Blockchain along with a few other students at Cornell. And uh, that was a really exciting time. That was, I think, a big part of where I am today. And, and then I transitioned to Avalab right out of college back in 2019. Main goal there was just helping grow the ecosystem and draw on developers and, and, and different, different projects. And so it's been a definitely been a journey since then and learned a lot along the way. Wonderful experience. And I think later we'll come back to that, right? Because something that I, from what you're saying, I have in mind, right? Like there are so many young and talented individuals in the crypto space, in the Web3 space, right? And this is something on the podcast that we constantly talk about, which is like share our experiences and share our story and share our advice, if you will, right? For the audience out there. Uh, because I would imagine the younger version of myself and maybe younger version of you as well, right? If we were getting started, you know, starting from fresh, right now in the moment, we would like to have someone that who are already in the space, who are already making a difference to almost give us some tips. With that said, do you have a... You know, this is again the hero journey is part of the question, right? Do you have a specific story that made you realize that, oh, crypto or Bitcoin is very serious? I must look more into it. Like the moment really made you decide and set your life on this path. So I want to like go dive a little bit deep on that part. It was really funny when we were first, uh, my brother actually brought up Bitcoin to me, and I was very confused about you know, what it meant to plug a machine in a wall and, and make some money. That was like really confusing to me. But it felt so weird and new that I had to just go into it. So that was like definitely the beginning of all that. But uh, what really I think transformed it is when I understood what Bitcoin at, at the principal level was trying to accomplish, uh, which was a, a fantastic vision. I was going around campus talking to a lot of different people about crypto. They immediately just thought drug money and criminal activity, right? And, and, and that blew my mind because that did not associate with the foundations or the principles of what blockchain was meant to do. And so it really confused me of what was really going on. And so I really wanted to dive deeper on that because I felt like no one, there was just not a lot of knowledge or, or people even talking about this. And so it felt like something new. I always, I always wanted to just go into something that was unique or new uh, because that felt like the biggest opportunity and it just happened to be crypto. Really, really any industry where there's just a lot of unknowns, whether regulation and uncertainty or I mean, you can look at like Uber, right? Like there was a lot of regulation uncertainty with that. Airbnb as well. There are a lot of really you know, big unknowns with on the regulation side. And there's just so many big opportunities when you go into an industry where there's a lot of uncertainties, a lot of unknowns, and uh, you get to be on the forefront of that. That's, I think, the biggest thing that clicked with me. That's, I think that's fantastic. And personally, 
speaking from my experience and speaking from my liking as well, one of the biggest reasons for me to be in the industry as well, which is, as you mentioned, right, be in an industry that's so new, so exciting, that is changing not only by the day, but also by the minute, by the hour, especially the people that we came across from the events or our colleague as well, right? We all have this very exciting vision about the future that we're building towards, right? So with that said, uh, you also mentioned about regulation. Do you have anything that when it comes to regulation in the States that um, you've been following uh, you've been following closely or anything you would like to share? And was looking at like, you know, all the security laws and what it means to issue a security token with like regulation 506C and, and regulation S and all these different ways of raising capital. Uh, but in terms of uh, where things are going on the regulation side, I think there's this... In short, there's just this battle internally with uh, different government bodies between the CFTC and the SEC, and uh, I think I think there's a lot more education that's needed. Uh, from from my understanding, uh, there's you know there's uh, a lot of these conversations happening. It's more about educating uh, because there's not a lot of people in these government organizations who understand the nuances of crypto. So this is a big opportunity for all of us to kind of step up and, and really educate on this because that I think is the biggest problem. But yes, absolutely. So not only for the younger generation, but also for the older generation, it's extremely, extremely important as well, right? So that uh, those people are essentially voting for the law or writing the law. They just don't, uh, they won't think as like black and white. They won't necessarily think about, oh, everything related with crypto are just scams, right? Or because, because maybe they just thought there's something like quite over their head. I think that if that happens, that will be uh, such a shame, right? So with that said, just for uh, for fun of it, do you mind uh, describing very simple words? Uh, what is a security token? It really, the main piece is that if there's like a central body that has uh, control or influence over the uh, profits for others, right? Like that's like the biggest core piece of it what is centralization what is decentralization in this space uh and so there's so many nuances right like you have things like governance tokens and all these other things that come into play and it's very interesting but i think that's like the core piece of it the profit from the work of a central body you know i i don't know what that even looks like or but uh um in this space it's very uh hasn't been well defined for sure Yes, absolutely. We're chatting. You mentioned to me that you uh, went to FDNYC and maybe share with us something very exciting that you saw or your takeaway from the event. Yeah, NFTYC was very interesting. I will say after that, I, I didn't want to go out to any other events for, for, for a month at least. It was just... <laughs> Just, just too, just too much drinking there, and too much going out, and uh, yeah. you know, DJs and this, that, and so it, 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 at the end of it, I was just like, enough, you know. <laughs> but, but I will say, I met a lot of great people. Um, the, the, the funny thing about NFT NYC is that, like, way majority of the people that go there uh, to these events are like don't know much about DeFi, like gaming projects, uh, or anything really beyond just simply buying an NFT. And some of them don't even know what it means to really buy an NFT. And so that really always was interesting to me is that like even like the previous NFT NYC event, I mean, just the most recent one, like the one I think it was back in the fall. And so that, that, that tells me a few things, which is we are so far away from mass adoption, but also so close. Like we have to figure out like buying an NFT from a, you know, a, like an education perspective is not too bad, but going into DeFi and then gaming projects through this crazy, terrible Web3 UX that we have is such a big gap. But we're so close because there's so much attention on NFTs, on crypto, but no one really goes deeper than just like buying an asset and like, that's it. And so I think we're so close, but so far right now. And that's what that was kind of my takeaway from uh, NFT and YC for sure. Not too long ago, I did an episode with Jay, uh, also from Avalas as well. We had probably solid like 20 minutes uh, discussion or more so I asked him a question and he gave me his opinion on about NFT, right? He said uh, in the whole Web3 and especially in the NFT, right? There's like the utility is always a meme, right? Which is like, oh, when we find that utility and when we find that, you know, we're going to reach mass adoption. So... <laughs> Yeah, um, I, when or soon, that's the biggest trademark. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. When we don't have exact, a specific date, but it's soon. Um, with that said, where do you see that for the next six months or a year or so? Some very exciting utility or some very exciting uh, 
innovation that we can see from the NFT world. Personally, I'm very stoked for uh, music NFTs. Mm -hmm. uh, also had a chat with Jay about that. I want to hear uh, your opinion, uh, Joe. Yeah, yeah. This is like the year of UX and the user experience is so important for NFTs actually when they have utility to be useful, uh, but are, they have to also be uh, just such a great user experience. It can't have the terrible Web3 experience that we all know. Um, so I think I think we will get there. Uh, a lot of pieces are coming together. This is like the year of UX for sure. And with with NFTs, I'm like pretty bullish on uh, anything that ties in with benefits. The way I like to think of NFTs really is there are perpetual interoperable tickets or rights, right? Hmm. They're perpetual in the sense that they always live on the blockchain. Uh, hmm. They're interoperable because you can have an asset that lives on one platform, but you can just index it and prove your ownership of it on another platform and say, hey, yeah, I own this asset and you can leverage that, right? And and their rights and tickets because you can assign, you know, benefits to them. You can assign uh, access and um, you're seeing that with, you know, uh, for example, Gary Vee did his fly fish restaurant and yeah. if you own that asset, uh, the NFT, you get access to that club. You're also seeing that with artists who are releasing these assets and saying, hey, if you own this, you can join my Discord chat uh, with like a hundred other people. So you can, you know, be in a close circle with me or you know uh, you can join me on my next tour vip any of them wherever i go i think the most exciting part about nfts for sure and i think i think i think actually the flipping nfts buying the jpegs and flipping them that will be like less than five that'll be like five percent of the market maybe even less honestly in the in the long yeah. term for sure when each cycle and when each a new big thing from the crypto and the web3 space comes into light in front of the whole world and that waves also bring in a brand new group of people than who and then those who are already in a party than those who are already deep in the web3 space right and when it comes to nft is the musicians the artists and the creatives right before that i'm constantly thinking about okay cool this technology and this innovation how is is how is the technology going to make their lives better right for, for example um i'm currently in porto in portugal right uh there are a lot of musicians singing on the street and or maybe selling their cd somehow or people selling their arts right before that you know either they can and they are still people doing that on the street or maybe do it through on facebook or whatsapp or in whatever ways right but that can only go so far right but however in this era in this age with the platforms that we are using now that they can turn their art and bring it into the essentially web three space and suddenly then they have the potential to reach an entire um globe essentially right with the right uh, distribution channels and um I'm super excited about more and more artists are really start using it, start promoting it very heavily. So that's something that I'm also very passionate about. And by the way, do you go to the Gary V's NFT restaurant in New York? I didn't. I I, uh, I guess I would have to buy his NFT or something like that to, to go. Yeah. But I, yeah. I haven't heard the latest on that, actually. Yeah. Uh, um, I heard about that a long time ago. So um, I got to check it out or, or ask yeah. someone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Nice. So with that said, give us like a quick introduction about like, like, you know, Web3 Gaming 101 and why you are very passionate, why you are very excited about it. Are you always a gamer? Or I played a ton of World of Warcraft back in the day, like just a tremendous amount, maybe too much. And it's funny how things <laughs> kind of comes full circle, uh, where I didn't realize I was actually going to go back into gaming, but uh, for actual work. And so I've always been a big gamer. But with, with gaming, I it's interesting. I, and I, it didn't really hit me until crypto came along, but it's like really painful as a gamer when you spend so much time on a game and and you're left with just like nothing but wasted time. And so I think we're hitting this you know new era where you actually get to be compensated for your time, right? So so a lot of these games, and I think so the the high level of gaming and crypto is that you get to uh, finally get to extract value from your skill and time into any sort of game. And, and the reason why blockchain is super important uh, piece of that is that you get to have a settlement layer where you get to have access to more liquidity and composability with other applications. Mm -hmm. So like those are the two things that are super important with gaming and blockchain and why blockchain is important is that you get that settlement layer with liquidity and composability. And so that allows you to actually finally extract value out of, out of a game. So when you spend thousands of hours on a game or 
uh, you get to finally sell your items to other players who want them. You get to buy items to get ahead or, or to, you know, skip, skip all that time that you'd invest and just buy an item instead of wasting to mine it or play for it. But uh, yeah, it's super exciting. And yeah, I could probably ramble on about this actually for, for quite some time, but <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. Actually, this came from a conversation I had with uh, one of the folks at the Avalanche Summit back in Barcelona, right? Um, so I'm going to ask you the same question, right? So Joe, what if a lot of the people were, what if the majority of users, they just play this game and just in order to cash out so they can pay their bills? How do we manage that or how do we... Um, overcome that right because personally if i were to start a gaming company i don't want people to purely play the game just so that they can you know turn the in-game assets into fiat money 100 percent. so i think i think just to roll back you know you've already actually had these two groups you've, you've had the the uh the buyers and sellers or the investors i we're gonna call them investors for simplicity and then you've had the yeah. gamers right world of warcraft yeah. had this as a good example you had right you had a lot of gamers and then you had people buying and selling gold uh, or even characters on the black yeah. market. And that was a terrible experience because people would get scammed. Uh, you didn't know who the counterparty was. There was no you know, official contract or it was just a terrible experience. And so this always existed. You even had this with CSGO. Uh, there, there was someone who uh, brought up a black market and uh, you had these skins traded for thousands of dollars. I remember being in eighth grade and uh, someone, uh, one of my friends traded a skin for like four grand. And I was like, what is going on right now? How, like, how... <laughs> You, you, it was like, oh yeah, you didn't know about this. I'm like, no, I didn't know you, you can make this amount of money. Uh, and so it's really, really crazy, but that always existed, right? So so nothing's really new in that department. I will <laughs> say that the reason why that question, I think, and I've heard this question a good amount, which is, you know, what about the, you know, people who are going to sell and dump on the token or, you know, on these assets? Well, create a really fun game first, like just really create a good game. Because I think what we've seen in, in terms of the past eight months, is uh, you've had the the DeFi games, you know, the ones where they're not really games, but they have some sort of, you know, graphics and, uh, but they're really DeFi games, right? Yeah. And, then, and then you've had the casual based games emerge. And that, that, that kind of was like the second stage. And then now I think by the end of this year to early next year, you're going to have the AAA games, you know, the first person shooters, the battle royales, the, uh, yeah. you know, RTS games. And like, this is going to be interesting because that, engagement on these type of games will be probably much higher but it, it that i think will play a lot in how these economics play out but mainly just create a really fun game first that's like the biggest thing regardless of um what kind of technology whether they're using the most important part the foundation which is like make something actually amazing like that uh, whether it's a ui or a ux or a design or everything all the details make sure they are fun and um, people are actually enjoy it which with that said i think that's you know one of the vision I have for uh, with the entire blockchain technology, right? Maybe and probably in five years or hopefully less, right? And we can just using like actually dApps, for example, our iPhone or our, our whatever the phone that we're using, right? And these are actually powered by blockchain, but we don't necessarily need to know that it's uh, powered by blockchain, right? And then in this way, that I just like so seemingly the experience, right? Which is like, I believe this is a uh, parallel with what you're saying about create a very fun game first. Absolutely. And then beyond the creating the fun game, that's where the economics becomes really tricky, right? Like you have yeah. uh, so many different designs coming out and I actually don't have, uh, I, we're thinking about this heavily internally, uh, like, like how to recommend specific economic adjustments and uh, to different projects. You know, you see the two token model, you see the fixed fixed supply token, and then you have the inflationary token. Like how did how do these actually play together? You know, what what mechanisms do you use for each one? And then but but I think like there's also easy things that you just don't do when you create uh, a, a web three game. And yeah. I think like for example, and, and this never happened in Web2 games, having a variable cost to enter and play. It's either fixed cost or free to play, right? And and so having a variable cost yeah. to play and enter a game it's 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 a pretty hard sell to for mass adoption right like you now have like one day you can enter a game and it will cost ten dollars or not that the next day these these assets go up and it costs a thousand dollars right like that, yeah that that i think there are these things that you have to avoid or like staking a token to earn more of that same token what's the actual economic value out of that so i think there's these things that we're thinking about heavily where, where you don't want to do certain things um but yeah a lot of really interesting things on the economic side to unpack for sure Yes, absolutely. I agree. 
So with us, tell us one, two, three games that you are playing or you want to play. Um, <laughs> Joe. Yeah, it's interesting. So there's this game that immediately comes to mind, which is Domi Online, where it's okay. kind of it's like it's like World of Warcraft in terms of it's like an MMORPG, same kind of style. They have classes and uh, spells and abilities and PvP and all these really fun things. And so it, I, I kept on telling people that I probably will lose my job when this game goes live because. I played a ton of World of Warcraft when I was when I was younger, and I you know might dive into it again with Domi. Uh, but yeah. uh, there's also a first person shooter shrapnel that I'm really really excited about. Uh, this is a really high quality team, um, and uh, it, you know it's like Escape from Tarkov type style game. Very impressed on the technical front with how they're approaching things. They're building on a subnet, and so they ask amazing questions whenever we talk with them. And I'm really excited about that team on all fronts. You know, I think I think there's then, then a whole bucket of, of games that I'm really just excited about. Uh, maybe less of a category of games that I typically play, but uh, like Castle Crush, right? Like they have 1 million monthly active users plus on their wow. Web2 game and they're building on a subnet uh, with their mobile game. It's probably, it, it, there's been so many people on our team who've just been playing that game nonstop <laughs> internally. And uh, you, know, you can create like these clans and, and battle each other. And uh, it's a lot of fun, but they're converting that game to Web3. But there's yeah. definitely a lineup of games that uh, we're really excited about on on the Avalab side, uh, and and a lot of them are are deploying on subnets, some deploying on the C chain. But uh, there's a lot of really yeah, it's it's a very very exciting time. I think I think we finally have the foundation of games that will be coming out that uh, will bring in mass adoption for crypto. So that's I think the most fun part about gaming and crypto is that that's going to bring actually the mass adoption first, right? Um, yeah. But yeah, yeah, yeah I'm very, very excited. But yeah, Domi Online, I probably will lose my job when I start playing that, and I'll and uh, I'll try to you know prevent you know I'll try to delay the time I start playing that game. <laughs>